Um, is it Tim? Michael? Maggie, yeah. Leslie, Kathy, Heather, and Richard. I guess my only comment should be that um, about the last problem. Which is that question, how do you show something is a general solution of a system? Uh, like, a, like a formula gives you the general solution of a system. Hmm? I mean, most of you actually checked that, I mean, made the computation to show that this is a solution for any alpha and beta, but um, <clears throat> why is it a general solution? Pick any point and show that there's an alpha and beta that satisfies That given any initial conditions, that is a point in the plane, this is a two dimensional system. Uh, that, that there is an alpha and a beta for which this uh, formula gives you a solution through that point. Okay, and so you can actually do that uh, like explicitly, right? You just say, well, pick a point x naught, y naught. And um, basically find the constants alpha and beta. And um, I think you also need the time. I think I turned them off because uh, oh, did you know because of that. Yeah. Okay. It's just really dark on the screen. Well, actually, wait, 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 because it's going to get better. Okay. Sorry. Just turn turn it off. Um, it's really blue now, but I'm going to try to keep it as white as I can. So, j yeah, you can just... Um, <clears throat> Alright, so that's... So the behind, I mean, of course this is just for the uh, canonical form, right? That's this is this is a system in canonical form. But I mean, the same thing. You don't have to do the computation just for this. It works for all um, systems that have repeated roots, right? For instance, and, and what's the reason? So if I have a system x prime equals a x, and I have x one. of t and x2 of t there are two uh, linearly independent solutions and what do we mean by what do we mean by linearly independent solutions But if I have a const, if I have a linear combination of them that is zero, right? That this implies what? I mean, the only way I can have a linear combination of the two solutions to be zero, it, it means that uh, the, the is the trivial combination. C1 and C2 are both zero. Okay. In other words, one is not a multiple of the other. 
One is not a, a constant multiple of the other. Because, <clears throat> right, if... Obviously, if, if one were a constant multiple of the other, then you could find the two constants that are not both zero at the same time, for which this linear combination is, is zero, and vice versa. If there is a linear combination for which one, at least one of this is not zero, then you can find, you know, let's say x1, let's say c1 is not zero. Then you can solve for x1 in terms and find a constant multiple of x2. Okay? Then the general solution uh, will be okay. We're talking about two by two systems here. Two by two. The general solution will be x of t is c one x one plus c two x two of t. Okay. And again, why is that? Well, certainly a linear combination is a solution, right? A, li a linear combination of solutions is a solution because I have a linear system. Okay. How do we f how do we figure out that um, all solutions are in this form? Well, it's enough to say, let's take, let um, x naught, you know, be x naught, y naught, be an initial condition. So basically, um, that's saying that x of 0, let me, let me do like this x of 0 is x naught, y naught, and we're trying to solve x prime equals ax with this initial condition. Okay? Well, we can solve this system by how about we can find C1 and C2 such that X0, Y0 is C1 times X1 at 0 plus C2, X2 at 0. Okay? Can we do that? How do we know that we can do this? Well, this this system is two equations with two unknowns, right? So when when can we find C1 and C2 uniquely? When can we solve a system of two equations with two unknowns uniquely? Hmm? Because the determinant of the matrix x1 of the coefficient matrix. So you put this at time 0, you put them in a column. I mean, you put columns form next to each other and you form this matrix. Right? That's the matrix uh, at time 0. And that matrix has a determinant that is, well, in order to solve this system, Uniquely, this determinant has to be how? Not zero, Not zero right? Non zero, right? Okay. 
So is it? Why? I mean, I claim that it is. Is it non-zero? Well, when is a determin a two by two determinant zero? When the columns are linearly dependent. One is a combination of one a linear combination of the other. But didn't we just say? You see, we we just kind of started with two linearly independent solutions. And this is true at any time t, so in particular it's true at zero. Right? So certainly those two, x1 at zero and x2 at zero, are linearly independent. They don't, one is not a multiple of the other. Okay? So this, this basically... Sh so in other words, uh, x1 and x0 and x2 of zero are linearly independent. They're not a multiple of each other in this case, two by two, two by two case. Okay, so we can find the constant c1 and c2. Okay, the fact that you, uh, I mean, what the constants are, it's you know, it's just a computation. But uh, the key is that these solutions that you start with are linearly independent. So now let's go back to that example where a is lambda lambda one zero. Then once uh, eigen vector was this, right? And another generalized eigen vector was zero one. In the sta this is the standard form. So when you write those solutions, so the first solution was e to the lambda t one zero, right? And the other solution was t to the lambda t plus e to the lambda t right so this is if you look at it, this is t1 e to the lambda t or uh, e to the lambda t t1 so that's exactly uh, that Okay, so what are the, why, why are these two linearly independent? Well, certainly at zero, when you put t equals zero, you get that is one, and t equals zero, you get the other one, right? Certainly those two vectors are linearly independent, okay? So that's basically enough. Um, what is also true is that these two functions as as functions of t, they're also linearly independent. I mean, as matrices, they're they're linearly independent, uh, and you can see that one is not a multiple of the other, right? So you can well, you can see this. This term is. Is different than any any of these terms. The scalar multiple of this would not make this one. Right? In fact, there is even more. I mean, if you've heard of Vronskins, have you heard of Vronskins? I mean, this is exactly that analog of the Vronskin. This determinant. Of this matrix is the Vronskian of the two solutions, x1, x2. Okay. So, it's the same story as in, you know, when you talk about um, equations, second order equations, linear equations. So let me denote it W of t, right? So what's the story there? It says that um, if either this is identically zero, so that's for all t, you know, x1 is a linear combination of the of x2. 
So the determinant is zero. Either that or the Vronskian is never zero. Okay. So in particular, I mean if that's so if it's not zero at one point t, that's for a time at initial time, if it's not zero initially, then it's never zero. Okay? So in, the, in this previous example, because the Vronskian was not zero at time zero, then it's never zero. Of course, you can you can um, um, compute the Vronskian in this case explicitly if you'd like to, but um, to convince yourself that it's not zero any, anywhere. But anyway, so these are two linearly independent solutions, and therefore you can achieve any initial condition by making a particular linear combination of them. So that's, you know, that's sort of the, um, the purpose of, of, of such, a, you know, such a question. It's not just to check that the solution, the linear combination is a solution. It's, it's the other way around, that any solution is in this form. Let's see, any questions from uh, that thing we did last time? Hmm? The classification? One more clarification on the nomenclature of the H function, the times the two axes together, mm -hmm. and the P and the flow and all that. That's, that's not clear. <coughs> Well, I was just wondering, I know you said in class that if you have two in real uh, distinct eigenvalues, then we can find an explicit conjugacy. However, in number 5B, it asks for an explicit conjugacy, and the eigenvalues are complex. Right, right, so right. So is that still possible to find? Yeah, it is, it is possible to find in other cases as well. I mean... We only talked about the case when the um, eigenvalue, uh, the uh, the the two eigenvalues are distinct and real. But in this in this case, it's also possible um, if you draw the. And I'll, I'm sorry, I didn't ignore this your question, but I'll come back to that because it's important. Um, yeah, in this in this homework five uh, B. You can actually explicitly find the solutions for the for each system. All right, and what they're going to be looking like is they're going to be concentric circles, because I think they're imaginary, purely imaginary uh, root uh, eigenvalues. Correct? Correct. For both. Yeah. And actually, they're identical, right? Right? So you have the identical picture, right? What is different though? What is what is the only difference? Which one are you on? Um, 5B, 5B. Chapter 4. No, uh, yes, yes, chapter 4, chapter 4. Okay. 5B, yeah. I think we worked 5A out in the in class or to some extent. So what's what's the only difference? Well, in in um, the Y system is canonical form, correct? Because it's alpha, negative, beta, beta, zero, uh, alpha. So the X system is not canonical form, but it has its canonical form, the Y system. Okay. So basically, that the the what is the how do you Make the correspondence between the X picture and the Y picture. 
through the yeah so what is H in this case you see hmm? But remember the H, the, uh, what we call con conjugacy, the H thing is a transformation of one plane into the other. So you have to say, you know, a point in this plane, what is it corresponding in that plane? Okay? That defines conjugacy, right? But since one is the canonical form of the other as far as the system, the metrics is concerned. I mean, we've done this several times. We've said, how do you find, how do you get the, 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 the solutions of the X system if you know the solutions of the Y system? T. X is TY, I believe, right? So, Correct? What does that mean? That means that this means that X of the solutions, right? As you describe them in the. So let's say you have a solution that starts here and goes this much, right? Alright? So this solution is going to correspond to, through this transformation, which you can find, right? Hopefully just, um, you know, from, from reducing that matrix, the first matrix to the second matrix, um, is going to be, I don't know, I don't know uh, exactly what T is. That's what you have to find out. Um, but it's going to be just a, In fact, it may not be the exact same one, it may be some shrinking, right? So I'm, 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 I may be uh, guessing it wrong, it might be this piece, right? So that's how this T the transformation ch maps the Y variables into the X variables. So it could be a rotation and a shrinkage. Okay. This is this is coming from the metrics, you know, the metrics coefficient for reducing it from that one, you know, that uh, you know, a was zero, one, negative four, zero, right? And this is canonical form. Do we have a, a name for this canonical form? We didn't. We just call it T inverse AT. Okay? So what is H? Well, what is, okay, so what is the meaning of H? The meaning of H is that it matches it's, it's again a transformation of a plane to the other. I don't know which, which, which one you... I think it's the other way around. Uh, it starts with H of some point X naught was what? Well, was such that the flow of the first No, the flow of the second at time t at h of t x naught is identical to h of the first flow of the first one starting at at x naught. Okay. So it's tracing the the solution curves. Okay. 
So it, it says that there is a map that you know you st if you apply it, if you look in the in the one picture and you follow that a solution curve and then you transform that through H, then what you the transformation is also a solution of the of the second system. So B in this case is is uh, T inverse A T. Yeah? So what's the map H? Again, tracking the solution in one uh, in one uh, in one phase portrait, and then making a map so that the image of this trajectory is is a solution of the second one. I think it's T or T inverse, right? One of the two. Isn't it T inverse? You see, this says it all. This says it all. This, the map. I mean, this is. This is exactly what I wrote there in a fancy flow flow uh, notation. Right? T inverse x x of t equals y of t. Well, what does this mean? This means that if you start with x naught at the initial condition, and you let this would be phi phi of t and x naught, h of that equals the flow through the second equation, through the second system, starting at what point? At y naught, which is h of x naught. Okay? So h so so what's what's the again what's the uh, what's behind this? You know, we we so far how do we plot a phase portrait of a of a linear system? We first found the canonical form of the matrix coefficient, right? We plotted the phase portrait of the canonical form and then through a transformation T we went back and, and drew the face portrait of the original system. Right? That transformation is point in this Y plane to point in the X plane. So all this is saying is that now if you want to make a conjugacy, these two are conjugate through this definition of following the flow of one system and through this map, T inverse, getting the flow of the of the second system. Two different, yeah. So in this this specific problem, the wording says find an explicit conjugacy. Yeah. So there could be could be either or, depending on which direction you want to map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But conjugacy is is a is a homeomorphism. So it is H. And with it, with its inverse. And there's no standard nomenclature in H. No, no. If you if you listed, you know, the first system and the second system, usually it's like H should go from the first plane to the second plane. But if if system A is conjugate to system B, then system B is conjugate to system A through the H inverse. So it's it doesn't matter what you call h. It's 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 just uh, fixing on the first system and the second system. Yeah. So anyway, so that's uh, it's tying it with a little bit with with this um, connection between a face portrait of a system and the face portrait of, of the canonical form. You know, it's saying that this—they're always conjugate to each other. It's not 
you're not you're never getting you cannot get a spiraling in system whose uh, canonical form is has repeated eigenvalues. These are not, you know, equivalent or they're not conjugate. Okay? And, you know, simply because that system must have complex eigenvalues, conjugate eigenvalues, this system. So, so the canonical form will not be that um, same as this one here, which is repeated eigenvalues. Okay. Um, does this make it easier now to? I mean, you just have to find t now, and that's. Uh, have we, we? I think we found t for a complex conjugate eigenvalue case, haven't we? You just have to take the real part and the imaginary part of that solution, of one solution, and put them in a matrix form, in a matrix. Yeah? And again, in that example, it doesn't matter which of the two conjugates you choose for the, for the, uh, for the T. So, so your solution is going to be A plus or minus I, but I B, for example. The eigenvalues? Those would be the eigenvalues. Uh, no, no, here's... The eigenvectors will be similar except for a change in sign of the oh, Okay, you're talking about complex eigenvalues? Yes. If you have complex eigenvalues? Yes. Then you have complex conjugate eigenvectors. Yeah, but you take the real part and the imaginary part. But one's plus and one's minus. It doesn't matter. Right, it doesn't matter. You can just take. Well, they have, they share the same real part and the same and and the imaginary part is opposite. Right. Yeah, and you can take any of the two, either plus or the minus of the imaginary part. You see, this t is not unique. Like even in this homework, I think every single one got a different t. When you have uh, repeated eigenvalues or complex conjugate eigenvalues. You don't have a unique T that actually creates that co that canonical form. So it, you can have uh, x1 and x2, or x1 and negative x2. They both work. Yeah, so it's not unique. It's not unique. You... Mm -hmm. So when you do this by the agent, is that It's only when they have the same exact canonical form with the same eigenvalues. Yes, exactly. That's exactly the point. See, if you have you you have systems that are conjugate that have different eigenvalues, sets of eigenvalues, and therefore different uh, canonical forms. But the same, the same structure, like they're both diagonal, right? Or they're both whatever. Um, you know, they're both uh, like this, this form. So, for instance, uh, one, 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 zero, and three, three, one, zero. Are these? Similar, do they have the same canonical form? Well, the same structure, but the canonical forms are different. Those, those are already in canonical form. They have different eigenvalues. They're, so they're not similar, as we say. You know, we say these matrices are similar if they have the same canonical form. Well, they, they are in canonical form, and they're not the same. Okay, but the system, the differential equations, you know, 
are this conjugate? And the answer is they are conjugate. Because you can just, I mean, you can just, um, well, we, I don't know exactly how the map it looks like, but we can find that map that takes one, uh, the solutions of the first and the solutions of the second. Yeah. I was just still kind of thinking about that outside of course. So is it safe to say that if the canonical form is not the same, then we cannot find an explicit H? Yeah. Um, well, if you're talking about two systems with both complex eigenvalues, then I think you can find explicitly because they're both going to be spiral, spiraling in or spiraling out. Let's say spiraling in, right? And it's all a matter of dilation or the plane of contraction, dilation, rotation, whatever, to match one with the other. So I think you can find explicit. I don't. The book doesn't show you the, that, or you know. But even though they they may not be exactly the same canonical forms, they may have different eigenvalues, uh, real parts, you know. But they have to have the same number of negative real eigen uh, real parts. So in other words, they have to be spiraling in both. You cannot have one spiraling in conjugate with one spiraling out. Okay, so this R equivalent, but although these canonical forms are different, okay, but that problem 5B says a different side of this story. It says uh, the system coming from, you know, any linear system is conjugate to the, its canonical form, to the system in canonical form, through that map, T or T inverse. So, that is all. Okay. So, conjugacy, and, and I want to move forward, but the conjugacy of two systems, linear systems, Uh, has uh, tells about behavior of solutions. Behavior of solutions as say t goes to infinity. And if systems have similar behavior, then they they are likely conjugate. They are they are actually that's the the thing is if if the if they're both sinks, then they're conjugate. Okay. The one case we haven't talked about, and there is a proof in the book. Um, so, if both sinks uh, at zero zero, then they're conjugate. They are conjugate. It may not be explicit, but they are conjugate. Um, and the example that we, we, we last time we did what what example did we do? We said a spiraling end conjugate with a with a um, spiraling end means there are two eigenvalues with negative real roots, so it has to be conjugated with let's say two distinct negative eigenvalues. So the picture was was this, right? So this is spiraling in and this was two distinct negative eigenvalues. Okay? And we actually showed um, we didn't quite show this. We showed that this is is conjugate with the um, that you know that um, straight to the origin case. 
okay, which is which would be the case. So this would be uh, alpha negative beta beta alpha. This would be the, which case? Lambda negative, but lambda lambda, right? Straight to the origin, and this is the case lambda and lambda two. Okay, so all of these are conjugate. The, the, the systems, okay. The matrices are are very different. Okay? So as, at the matrix level, they are very different. But at the system level, if we're concerned about the behavior of the solutions, then they are the same. I mean, they both they all go towards the origin, right? And we said this is not an explicit. This is not explicit. Um, but also, uh, there is this case of. of repeated eigenvalue so this would be alpha alpha one uh, excuse me lambda lambda one zero all right let's say lambda is negative so we're, we're, we're also going in inward and the claim is this is also conjugate to the, all of the previous ones so how you know how do you show that it's conjugate to for instance, this system. So this is conjugate. Well, how would that construction that we talked about last time tra uh, transfer to this? Well, it's the same thing. You set up a target sort of circle around the origin, and then you say, if I have a solution that goes, started at some point, that's x naught, and then you follow the trajectory until it hits this target, you record the time it takes from this to this, right? And then you go, you follow the backwards the second this would be h of x naught okay there is one caveat here there is one thing that may not uh, work really well uh, and that is, you see, for the spiraling in, you always know, I mean, you know for sure that starting in, like outside of this target, you're going to end up hitting the target and then go inside. Okay? This is not always the case with this system, okay? Despite of how it looks on that picture. So the, the book talks about that, and I just want to mention this. So there is there is a note. If lambda is greater than one, then this is always happening. But if lambda is less than one, then there is a problem. Okay. So here's an example: uh, one half. If you take a to be one half, one half, one zero. Okay. Take that system. Let's let's just plot it really quick here. Come on. Let's just plot it really quick. Okay, so it's one half times x plus y, and one half times y. Okay, and let's center it around the origin. Okay. Um, well, okay. Let me do the negative one half. Is that okay? So negative one half. Negative one half. So I'm going inward. And you might not actually see it very well. Uh, 
Um, but if you draw a circle around this, okay, you can see that the, in, the, the trajectories can hit the circle and not enter the circle, but just go outside the circle and hit it a second time and then enter the circle. Okay? So that's a problem because, you know, it's not happening for all solutions. So let me, again, I'm going to put an absolute value, so I'm going to take a negative a half so it goes inward. So the point, the point I'm trying to make here is, is the following. You may have this target, but you may have the solution going like this. Well, that's a hard way to, it's a hard one to, to draw. Uh, so in other words, you may not have a unique time when it hits and then it just stays inside. I'm going to try to force it. Okay, it's not going to be very, very nice, but looking, but it may be like this. I'll go like this. Okay. And this happens for some, but of course not for all, right? So, so the time of hitting the target may be discontinuous, in fact, for, you know, I mean, do you, if you take the first time of hitting, then for this system is this, right? Well, it's not, is it discontinuous? Then it goes here. Yeah, yeah. See, when it kind of t uh, hits this tangentially, right? Then the moment you move a little bit up, it's going to do another round before it gets to the first time. So it's a discontinuous time. So that's going to lead to a discontinuous age. Okay. So there's a trick that uh, that that is done here in this in this case. And and this is only the case when when. Um, uh, uh, the solutions come at a very kind of uh, small angle. You see, the smaller the lambda, the smaller the angle. Do you see that? So I can I can use this lambda here. I can put a, an L, and I can change this L, 0 0.01. Oh, I want negative. See, so it's even kind of, it's so small, right, that angle. It's almost horizontal. That was extreme, so let me, ch let me change this to point 0.1. Right? Actually, in this case, you can actually see. If you set a target to be like um, the unit disk, right, you can see how that, that uh, goes, goes wrong. Okay? The smaller lambda, the more horizontal it is, then um, the solutions don't enter and stay in that target so that you can define that time and, and therefore age. Okay? So what's the, what's the trick? And I'm going to spend more time. It's actually on this page 71. The trick is to first dilate uh, the y-axis. You see, so it's basically multiplying by, so in that case, let t to be 1, 0, uh, excuse me, 1 epsilon zero, 0, where epsilon is small. Small, that is just smaller than lambda, actually. Is enough. Then, then consider. So first, make it conjugate with this system. Okay. So this was the x system, right? It's really kind of. It's almost horizontal, so it's very, sh very sharp turns here, right? Well, make it look like. It's not canonical, 
Well, okay. No, they they're both canonical. Yeah, I mean the picture is is for the canonical form, but change the canonical form uh, by 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 basically making this you know come come at an angle that that is okay. So change the canonical form, and if you do the computation, the computation shows you t inverse a t is indeed lambda epsilon zero lambda. Instead of a one sitting there, a big big one. If lambda is small, that big one causes the trouble. So you just take something where you make that thing smaller than that lambda itself, or the absolute value of lambda. Okay. So then this is conjugate to this, and then this is conjugate to the other one through that through that uh, reason that we had earlier with the targets and all of that. Okay. So that's that's all there is. I I've seen actually. In this homework, uh, and then I've got a question which is very important to address um, about a computation done in the book for repeated eigenvalues uh, and finding that generalized eigenvector. Okay, and if 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 you uh, read the, the the book, which you should. Um, Well, okay. Let me just say uh, for a general. So it's a general matrix. So it's a general system. Then you find x1 by solving a minus lambda identity x1 equals zero. Okay. And x2 is a minus lambda identity x2 equals x1. Okay. That's why. That's why I said, really, you know, happens how you find the, the second vector, right? So, if you read that uh, part of the book where it talks about the general eigenvector, then you'll see, I mean, you, you really see a, li a little bit different approach. It's basically showing that you can find x2 by saying a, uh, what was that, a w equals alpha v plus, so v was x1 and then you say um, for any other w a times w is a vector in this space so if I take w to be independent than v then a w it has to be a linear combination of these two, right? And then then you, um, um, through you know, a couple of reasoning, you end up with um, saying that. What are you saying? You're saying that um, a well, you end up with uh, beta being lambda, right? Or actually, beta over I think beta over alpha. Okay, or should I say alpha equals one and beta equals lambda? Alpha equals one and beta equals lambda. Probably that's easiest. So you end up with a w minus lambda w equals v, which is x one. So indeed w is x is the x two. Okay, but it's not a practical way to do to to actually do the computation. You don't want to prove it every time you you don't prove a, a statement every time you do a, an example okay so it's the same way uh, before is that you don't want to make this construction every single time that you're asked to deal with this this kind of issues all you have to say is you know uh, all you have to say is the number of negative uh, real parts uh, of eigenvalues with negative real parts is the same. Right? That gives you conjugacy. All right. so don't try to make it more complicated than it is. I mean, in the cases when it asks you for explicit, yeah, then you have to do an explicit. But sometimes you cannot find explicit, so it wouldn't ask you for explicit 
uh, if it didn't have an explicit uh, conjugacy. Okay? All right, let me go to... Um, talk a little bit about higher dimensional systems. And we're still talking about a linear system of equations with the same number of uh, equations as unknowns. So A is going to be a square matrix, n by n. Okay. And there is a whole sort of theory that uh, is an extension of the 2 by 2 case that talks about how many eigenvalues, how many eigenvectors you can have, right, and all the rest. So for example, um, uh, n by n matrix has how many eigenvalues? n eigenvalues because these are the roots of the characteristic um, po polynomial, you know, well, okay, so there are solutions of this characteristic equation. A, the term of A minus lambda identity equals zero, and the term of A minus lambda identity is, this is a polynomial of degree, And in fact, right, you can do that um, expansion. So it's going to be, you know, let's say a11 minus lambda, a22 minus lambda, ann minus lambda, a21 or a12, a21. So where is lambda appearing? Only on the diagonal. How many of them? And when you do determinants, you're going to be minus 1 to the n, lambda to the n, plus blah, 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 everything else, right? Okay, so it's an n-dimensional, it's a, it's a polynomial degree n, and it has n roots, complex roots, okay? So, some of the eigenvalues may be complex. Okay, in fact, yeah. Those can happen. Um, some may be repeated. And it could happen to have repeated complex eigenvalues. So an example that I have here in the book is, um, it's actually worked, I, well, okay, it's not really worked out as far as computing the eigenvalues, but um, here it is. So it's 1, negative 1, 2, negative 1, 0. I'm sorry, I'm, I should read that by, by row. So 1, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, negative 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, negative 1, 2, 0, 0, negative 1, 1. Okay? Well, how do we compute the determinant? of the characteristic polynomial of this. You, you just subtract lambda off the diagonal, right? And it's a nice thing to realize that there is some sort of a block structure of this. It's a 4 by 4 matrix, but there is this lower block which is 0. Okay? And do you know how to compute the determinant of this 4 by 4? You can do it as a cofactor, but to take advantage of this block that is 0. It's, it's, like a, it's like an upper triangular matrix if you were to think of this as blocks, right? So how do we is the term of this times the term of this minus the term of this times the terms of this. But the term of this is zero. So it's just the term of this times the terms of this. So it's just
this times, I mean, again, it only works when you have this block that is zero there. And now you can do the computations here, and I, I haven't really done them, but I mean, you're welcome to. Well, okay, you can see it's true. So it's lambda plus one squared. So it's lambda plus lambda squared plus one, everything squared, right? So what are the eigenvalues of this matrix? Plus or minus i. Each of them repeated twice, right? So if you were to list, when I say there are n eigenvalues, they are minus i, minus i, plus i, and plus i, right? But, you know, okay? And of course, you can uh, factor this. You know, uh, lambda squared plus 1 is lambda minus i times lambda plus i. So this is going to be, you can see the, uh, the multiplicity. This is called the multiplicity of this eigenvalue, right? All right, so that's, that's the thing. What eigenvectors do we have? You know, when you have repeated eigenvalues, you may have... Uh, for for the eigenvalue i, for instance, you may have one eigenvector, linear independent eigenvector, complex or not, right? Or you may have two linear independent eigenvectors. Okay. So there is that. It's it's basically becoming a zoo if you are you know if you if you don't think about it systematically is that uh, if you have a multiple eigenvalue then you can have basically any number of uh, linearly independent eigenvectors correspond to that eigenvalue and in this particular case the canonical form well in this particular case for lambda equals i there's one linearly independent eigenvector. So what does that mean? And also for lambda equals negative. Uh, well, actually I'm not sure. Let's see. I think so. Yeah. And for lambda equals negative, because um, for this is one linearly dependent eigenvector. So the canonical form looks the following way. Okay. Well, there's going to be a block corresponding to i. Uh, actually, let's. There's no good order. It's i or negative i first. Doesn't matter, right? Let's, let's do i first. Let's see what. Yeah, the book is using it for i. So, so 0, 1, negative 1, 0. Okay? So that, this corresponds to, this is alpha, negative beta, beta alpha with alpha zero and beta one. Yeah? And here, there is corresponding to negative i, right? So this is for lambda equals i, and this is for lambda equals negative i. But, uh, the fact that you don't have two linearly independent eigenvectors means this is not going to be a diagonal block, block diagonal. So the, the, this means this is not zero and this is, I mean, okay, not both of these are zero. So what you do is you make this, I mean this one of them is zero but the other one is uh, this strange, excuse me, this identity, this is the identity here. Okay. Is that any so 
So you see how complex it can it can it can uh, uh, get. And I gave you a four by four example, but even three by three example. So three by three examples are um, can be classified pretty much. So let's see a three by three example. Um, a is well. Let me let me just state what are the possible canonical forms. Well, there's a diagonal. If I have three distinct real eigenvalues, right? You can have a polynomial of degree three that has three distinct eigenvalues, can't you? What if one is real and the other one is complex? The complex conjugate. Right? Remember we said if there's a complex eigenvalue, then the complex conjugate is also an eigenvalue. Since we're talking about real matrices. So what is this? Lambda one, alpha, then it's a block here, right? Right? Well, for How many eigenvectors will correspond to lambda 1? Just one, because it's simple. It's a single eigenvalue. Um, there's going to be one eigenvector corresponding to lambda 2 and the complex conjugate corresponding to lambda 3. So this form corresponds to the real part and the imaginary part right, of that eigenvector. So that's how you would build that T. So the T would be x1, right? Uh, not just uh, and then u2 and v2 for instance right where x2 is u2 plus i v2 yep and of course x3 is u2 minus i v2 Okay. So you can find. You can, I mean, if if you're in this situation, one one real root and two imaginary, then you can find t. You can find the canonical form. And again, this is three components, three components, three components. So it's three by three matrix, right? Um, I want to go back here, and this is. This is one of the worst cases when you have repeated complex eigenvalues with deficiencies in the number of eigenvectors. Okay. Um, anyway, I want to I want to come back to I want to come back to this because I'm not sure. Since this is a complex conjugate, then obviously you're going to get the complex conjugate eigenvector of the one and to be for the other. So I don't know the counting of that uh, number of eigenvectors. Okay. So um, what is the other possibility? Repeated. So here I really want them not repeated, right? So here I want them better to not to be zero. But if you have repeated, then then that's where the uh, many cases can happen. So if I have lambda one is double. Repeat it. When lambda two is different than lambda one. Actually, yeah. Lambda one is repeated. Lambda two is different than lambda one. Then I can have I can have two eigenvectors corresponding to lambda one. Right? 
x1, x2, right, in one eigenvector corresponding to lambda 2, let's call it x3, so then t is just going to be x1, x2, x3. Okay? But that's, there's another case, there's another possibility when you have or, so you can have lambda 1, lambda 1, 1. So lambda 1 is still repeated, and uh, what else? But only with one eigenvector, x1. Then how do we, what is t going to be? And of course lambda 2 is a simple eigenvalue with uh, eigenvector x can I call it x3 here? probably the easiest would, would have been to if you don't mind I'll, I'll do this lambda 1 equals lambda 2 is repeated and lambda 3 is simple so this is going to be okay Ex that's right um, and here let me do the same lambda 1 equals lambda 2 is repeated and lambda 3 is different so then it's just to uh, don't don't get too uh, tangled up in the notation okay so how do we build uh, a second vector to put in that second column? Well, to get that form, you have to use exactly that generalized eigenvector thing. So it's x2, where x2 solves a minus lambda 1 identity. That's the three-dimensional identity, 3 by 3. x2 equals x1. Okay? And there's one more case, yes? Um, just going back to where we have the real Complex, uh huh. So for T, we have an X1 and a real, and then a unit B, is that just from one of the, just from one of the, just from one of the two? Um, yeah. So it's just, it's, it's the eigenvector corresponding to the complex eigenvalue. And you, you pick the real and imaginary part. It's just for, just for lambda 2, not lambda Well, lambda 3 is going to be minus. So again, is that question is, do I pick V or minus V? The answer is, is the same. It, it doesn't matter. It will give you the same, uh, the same thing here. An imaginary part, yeah. The ones that you get through the computation. Uh, and finally, as I said, there is possibility that lambda 1 equals lambda 2 equals lambda 3 is a triple eigenvalue. Or eigenvalue with multiplicity 3. Let's call that lambda. So what's... And, and in this case, you can have 3 distinct... Uh, excuse me, three linearly independent eigenvectors. Corresponding to lambda, or you might have only two linearly independent eigenvectors corresponding to lambda, in which case, what do you have to do? I mean, the ordering of this is not so. You can you can shuffle the vectors around. Let's let's do this other one here. So, so you see, you can think of these blocks that are on the diagonal. Here, I have three blocks because I have three eigenvectors. Here, I only have two blocks. So, the number of blocks equals the number of linearly independent eigenvectors. 
Okay, but within a block, how do we figure out the uh, t? So, so there's going to be the one eigenvector here, another eigenvector here, and this is going to have to be a generalized eigenvector. Okay, and finally, there is a case when there is only one eigenvector for lambda. And in that case, there's, there's only one block. And the block is, has ones on the diagonal, uh, above the diagonal. Okay? And for this, here's how you compute, here's how you can build the um, matrix. X1 is the eigenvector, the only one. How do you compute the x2? Well, you solve this equation. a minus lambda identity x2 equals x1. And how do you, solve, how do you find x3? Well, you repeat this process, of, but now with x2 in the right-hand side. This is not going to be by far unique. It's not a unique um, representation. Uh, I mean, uh, matrices, but the, the, the form, the canonical form, is unique. Okay? All right. So, let's see. I think um, one thing that we, one needs to uh, talk about is what determines the number of eigenvectors? How do, you, how do you find out how many blocks should you have? Okay? That is something... Um, well, for 3 by 3 cases, you can just uh, solve. When you solve that system, right? What's the system? For A minus lambda identity, for the eigenvector. Okay? You solve that system, it's going to be a 3 by 3 system, and the question is how many independent solutions do you have? Do you know how to figure that out? No. Um, let me see. The problems I assigned here are three by three, three by all are three by three. So, well, except number nine, which is four by four. But actually, that's a little bit different. Okay, so you can do number nine, um, and again, you can do all of them, maybe except number eight. So delete number eight. Okay, so ignore number 8 and number 15. Okay, number 8 and number 15, take them out of the, this homework. Okay, we'll talk about this uh, next week. Still haven't had a chance to talk about the projects. Um, let, me, let me just say one word for the grad students, which are... Four of them are here. So um, I, I will post on the website the exact projects, but they will be in the line of, along the lines of the chapters 10, 11, and, tw well, no, sorry, 11, 12, and 13. So there is, so there are six students, so I would encourage you to find somebody and, and so two, for, two students for a project. One would be applications in biology, like population biology. I'll talk about population dynamics, I'll talk about that. Um, and I'll give you the details. Second one will be applications to circuit theory, and um, I have some applications in mind also from biology. <laughs> um, but you know, you can also do it from just electrical circuits because that's what it is. And the third project will be in applications in mechanics. So those will be, um, I don't know, people that are. Um, interested or, or, or I, do, I, I think the chapter talks about celestial mechanics so um, it can be that or it can be any any topic related um, to mechanical systems so um, anyway so the, the structure is, is so for now I'd like you to uh, just look at this chapters and kind of decide on which of the three you want to work on and possibly find a team teammate or something.
Okay, um, and and um, I read those chapters. Okay, and I will have sort of a follow up from each chapter, uh, a task to actually accomplish related to that that uh, topic. Uh, the timeline uh, again. I'll put it on on the website, but just um, quickly, I'd like to have some some initial sort of report before this. Um, well, before spring break or shortly after, so immediately after spring break. Probably, I prefer before, but you know, if you need time during spring break, that's fine too. Um, and then I'll provide feedback, and then I'll have a, a final. You know, I want a final report. Um, you know, before the final week of classes, I guess. Um, and possibly one of the teammates to present sort of, sort of uh, that application or that piece of the application <coughs> in class in one of the meetings. Okay? I'll, I'll give you more details uh, on the website. All right, thank you.